What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and in today's Kerbal Space Program video we're going to be constructing a space station. I love how I always start these videos off and then go on to say what I'm going to be doing in the video despite the fact that I I don't think I've ever not put the the subject of the video in the title and thumbnail, but you know, it's a tradition at this point, I'm going to carry on with it, and I guess it's nice to just formally introduce videos this way. We're going to be building a space station, and I'm going to make a little space station, because I've never made a little space station before, and I, I've been seeing this trend, I sometimes see on the subreddit and in my Discord server, people often post like micro scale space stations, like most of the space stations I build are either kind of like realistic scale as in like 2.5 meter diameter pieces, or you know just stupid, <laughs> stupidly sized things like in Green Harvest, but uh, some people make space stations where every single component is no bigger in diameter than the Mark 1 size pieces, like you know the scale I'm building at now. And I thought, you know, they look kind of cute. I really like the aesthetic of the small space stations. So I thought, I'll build my own. And even though it's a very lightweight payload that could quite easily be launched as one giant monolithic slab, uh, we're going to build it in multiple launches just because it's a little bit more realistic. And it is very, I really like the satisfaction of constructing things in multiple launches, especially space stations. So that's what we're going to be doing today. A little, a, sm a micro scale space station. Uh, in multiple launches, just two launches, I don't want this video to drag on too long, and uh, that's it actually, that's the video. So I hope you enjoy it, uh, I was a bit pressed for time this week, which is why the vision might not be uh, of a very epic and difficult scale for a lot of people, but I know some people still struggle with things like docking, and it was kind of a tricky dock in this video, so in this video, in this mission, well I guess it is in this video as well, but the mission at hand on screen, the dock was quite difficult. Another thing that was difficult is this thing here. So I wanted this whole like robotic -y bit. So you may have seen, I just built the science bay of this thing and it's all constructed inside a fairing piece without obviously the fairing shell around it. And I thought it'd be cool to have these big solar panel arms that extend out like I did in my previous unfolding space station video. However, I don't know what it is, but something about these solar panels being laid out in this way, that when I extend them, as in like the solar panels, not the piston itself, the Kraken just completely consumes it. And I went through several uh, attempts at making it and it just never ever worked. But here it is at the moment, it unfolds fine, it's when you like reload the vessels, if you switch vessels and then load back, or just, I don't know, F5 and F9, the solar panels are just completely destroyed. So we do have to uh, revise the solar panel layout on this part of the ship, we'll get to that when we get to it, but just to pre-warn you now, this is kind of, this is this was the dream, this was the hope, this was my hope of how things would look, it didn't end up working out that way unfortunately. So now we're going to construct, now we've done the most, the most highly detailed aspect of this space station, that being the uh, science uh, bay arm, we're going to just construct the rest of it. Now obviously we can't put a science lab on board, oh actually I spoke too soon, I added these little scanning arms as well, purely for the aesthetic, you know, obviously this thing being a space station, it's not going to come uh, into near enough proximity to actually use that scanning arm, but it still looks nice nonetheless. And then like I say, now we can get on to the rest of the station. Now we can't use the laboratory modules, which is a shame, but we can use the uh, passenger bays and just pretend they're labs. And then we've got this re-entry module here. It's the three-seat one from the Making History DLC, and it's going to serve as our escape pod, which means this thing has a crew capacity of three if we wanted to, you know, care about the well-being of our Kerbals, which I know it may be a controversial <laughs> thought to feel, but I, I do care about my Kerbal safety, so we're going to make sure that this thing carries no more than three Kerbals at a time, and that's the escape pod there. And then we're building, I don't know, a asteroid detection telescope arm. I guess we can call it the, I don't know, engineering quarters, and as you can see on the other side, we've got a little refueling bay, as well as a convertitron thing, again, just mainly for the aesthetic, because there is no means of grabbing onto an asteroid or any other thing that can be mined, uh, or indeed any drill. Uh, and there's no ore tanks at the moment either, but those will be added. But again, I just like the aesthetics, and I don't know, we can expand this thing if necessary, and in the future, we may end up needing the facility provided by the Convertitron. But like I say, the main the main driving force was the aesthetics. I mean, let's face it, any space station is mainly only built for the aesthetics, especially ones like this, where, I mean, we've got some refueling ability, but not very much. 
Uh, it was, I mainly made it because I really liked the look of the uh, micro scale space stations that I see posted here, there and everywhere. So that's the main structure of the space station. Done. Well, I guess, it, I guess it was done a while ago, but now I'm just adding little uh, upgrades. I did have the uh, telescope on a rotation server at one point, but I did end up removing that. Now it's all about just, you know, making this thing look as space stationy as possible. Obviously, again, doesn't really have much of a useful function, this space station, but I just like slapping lots of things on, making it look really, I don't know, cluttered and janky, much like real life space stations uh, at this point. Uh, at this point, like, we're reasonably going to build another space station during this video's recommendation by YouTube's algorithm lifespan. I know they keep plan. I think there is a plan that once they deorbit the International Space Station, which is not that long now, I don't think. Uh, Russia and US have already agreed to collaborate on another space station, so that would be pretty cool. But it probably won't be built at this micro scale, which is a shame. I mean, this thing does have parts that are based on NASA parts, as well as parts that are based on uh, Soviet parts. So I guess that's kind of neat. You know, it's a real reflection of real life space station, or at least, you know, a reflection of the real life International Space Station. So, uh... I don't know. There's that. There's that. Speaking of the International Space Station, I, I just saw that they released a Lego set of it, which is obviously very exciting. And as you may have seen, you know what I said earlier? Those solar panels cause cracker attacks. Here is a little sort of quick montage of me attempting to have that not happen. They just... It's not... It wasn't good. I tried several different configurations of the solar panels and none of them worked. Then I tried just having it set up so there were no solar panels attached. And as you can see, it was nothing to do with the actual piston or hinge or anything like that itself. Because And then if we, like, you know, take that structure that we just tested and it worked fine, add solar panels to it. And the solar panels aren't, like, clipped into each other or anything or attached to things that are, like... I haven't attached it to something, then offset it so it's floating. They unfold... There was F5, F9, as in, you know, to simulate switching vessels. And as you can see, Instacracken, insta not a chance to ever even do anything about it. So unfortunately, after lots and lots of attempts, there's another attempt. So this is, <laughs> that was pretty funny, actually. So for that one, I tried removing the piston, see if it was the piston interacting with it funny. Not, I tried many other variants. Like, you guys are probably going to suggest things down in the comments. I probably tried it. I spent a good... I mean, it was probably like 10 minutes of testing, but that's quite a long time. There aren't that many different ways you can test solar panels in this game. So in the end, I just went, I, I just elected to get rid of them, slapped some RTGs down on that end, then added these little solar panels across the whole uh, fuselage of the station. We will add some extending solar panels as well, just because it makes this thing look a bit more space stationy and... Really, that's a good uh, that's a good aesthetic to strive for when designing space stations. Uh, I think I'm trying to think what else we've. Oh yeah, I, I just said <laughs> I just said I haven't added the extending solar panels, but I don't think looking at this thing now, that there's anything else that needs adding. So uh, in just a second, once we've uh, done the extending solar panels, we can start thinking about setting this thing up in the form of uh, you know rockets that we can launch. Like I said, I wanted this thing to be multiple launch. Uh, I didn't want to just launch this one giant payload, even though we could, and it would probably realistically fit into a five meter wide uh, fairing, especially if we launched it in the style of either have it all unfold using the hinge pieces, or, you know, in my classic single launch space station style, so before any of the unfolding pieces, you know, the robotic parts were added, I used to just launch things with loads of monopellant thrusters attached to them, and I would just launch them in like one big stack that could easily realistically fit into a payload fairing, and then have them sort of steer themselves into a configuration once in orbit. We could have easily done that, much like the Juno space station I built. Not Juno space station, Juno surface station I built not that long ago. But I wanted to do things, I don't know, a slightly more in line with how the real world does things. So here we are, you can see me uh, saving the two uh, peripheral arms as separate uh, substages, and then as you can see, we have now cross faded over to the vehicle assembly building, so we can put put we can put the primer module inside a rocket. But the first thing I did, as you can see, is I replaced the monopropellant thrusters uh, with the I think I think they're called the Spider engines, basically ones that run on liquid fuel and oxidizer, just so I could see the delta V readout on the uh, you know staging panel. So I can ensure that this thing has enough range to actually safely jettison away from the space station in the event of an Ebola outbreak. And then also, you know, has enough Delta V to deorbit itself as well. Um, 
which, you know, takes a little bit more delta V than you might think, because I'm not going to be aiming for like a 70 kilometer orbital height for this thing. I was actually going to aim for about 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 200 kilometers, because if we've got a space station in orbit, I think we've got two stations in orbit, actually. I'm trying to think now what what <laughs> what space program save game I'm on at this point. I think I've only got one station in orbit, actually, but that I know is at 100 kilometers. So I wanted to have it, you know, a distinct orbit so I could quickly see on the tracking station which station I was selecting. So we're going to aim for a... Orbital height of 200 kilometers, which means it's going to take a little bit more delta V to deorbit oneself from that height. So I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of extra delta V. Uh, one thing some of you may have noticed, you might be saying, Matt, you've forgotten to add parachutes to the re-entry module. And I would say, ah, 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 no, 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 my friend. It is obviously based on the uh, Russian re-entry modules, and those did not come with parachutes, to my knowledge. Maybe there was like one rare variant that someone's now going to mention in the comments that did have a parachute attached, but for the most part, the expectation of the cosmonauts is that whilst when it um, decelerated from hypersonic speed and was just falling through the atmosphere, they would then, you know, jump out and then parachute down themselves. So that's what I expect my brave Kerbals to do in the event where they need to re-enter Kerbin's atmosphere inside the re-entry module. But all of that is ancient history now. As you can see, I'm well underway with the construction of the second rocket. Rocket 2 of 2. I decided to put the two peripheral arms in, you know, one launch because I feel like it's a pretty small payload, at least as far as Kerbal Space Program goes. I know by real world standards it's still incredibly heavy, but you know, nonetheless, it's well within the capabilities of Laon Aerospace. In fact, no, it's Laon Aerospace 2, the second one, uh, Space Program. So as you can see, I've just added them up in this little stack like this, and then I'm adding a small set of uh, reaction wheels and a probe core to the stage below it, just so we can deorbit it, not leave any clutter left in space. And, uh, you know, we'll add some parachutes later on as well, so it can actually be landed and be recovered and save us a little bit of money. I didn't do that with the other rocket, as you may have, <laughs> you may have noticed when I was constructing the other rocket. I just put the means of, uh, you know, I just I just added the means for it to deorbit itself, but then it would just get destroyed on impact. It was a much smaller you know, it was a much cheaper rocket. We don't have to worry too much about the expense. But this is a slightly bigger boy. Uh, we want to make sure it can easily be recovered and thus recoup us some precious funds that we can spend it on rides at Velocity Lake. That's right, guys. This whole video is an ad for my Planet Coaster videos. I think they're really good and I think you might like them. So there, you can just Google Matt Lamb Planet Coaster. I don't know. Anyway, now we need to come up with the crew. So I decided to hit the Discord and ask people, well, I said first few people to reply, get featured. So there, there, we, there, there that's how I selected the crew for this mission. So there you are. And uh, now we can just cut across to a, an epic Photoshop time lapse where we construct an epic flag for our epic mission. It took a great amount. I had to spend many hours on this Photoshop job. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of it. So please don't say anything mean about it. There it is. It's beautiful <laughs> and, and it's fluttering in the wind. It's a beautiful day for the small station. And there is our, our brave crew, courtesy of the Discord server, a link to which, if you'd like to join it, is in the description of this video. This is the way for all of my videos, actually, ever since we launched it, which was actually back in 2017. It was when I did my uh, Falcon 10 rocket, like my reusable rocket that's obviously a parody of the Falcon 9. So it's the Falcon 10 epic video. You check it out. It's old, but it's still gold. Anyway, as you can see, we are well underway with the launch now. So we've ditched to the initial SRBs. We were initially only having the main engine at 50% thrust. It was only there, really, to uh, get our TWR to about 1.3. That's kind of a good sweet spot. Between 1 and 1.5 is a good TWR to aim for when launching off Kerbin. Uh, but now the SRBs have gone. We are significantly lacking in the old thrust department, so we can fire it up to full throttle and then just coast our way into space and most of the flight is going to be spent burning at 45 degrees until our time to our apoapsis is about a minute and is satisfactorily high that we're not going to start accelerating uh, too low in the atmosphere and end up wasting a bunch of fuel just fighting the air resistance. I think though we got a pretty nice balance in this flight plan so I was, I, I was actually quite proud of this rocket's ascent. And now as we approach orbit we're going to just get ourselves to a you know a, a 200 kilometer orbital height. I don't think there's much more for me to say about it. So now I'm introducing a new segment uh, to these videos. It's called Matt Talks. Matt does a review of a whiskey. 
and that is to ensure that my videos are clearly, you know, these are these are 13 plus uh, age uh, of viewers. That's how old viewers must be to view these videos. I've seen what's happened to people with copper and I'm paranoid. So, you know, welcome to this new feature of my commentaries. Um, whiskey talk with I haven't even thought I literally I haven't thought of a name for this series yet. Maybe someone has a, a good Matt's Maltz, possibly. I don't know, but this week, the whiskey I have had is Maker's Mark. It really is the one that changed the way we think of bourbon, all because one man changed the way he thought about making it. That's right, Bill Samuel Sr. He simply wanted to make a whiskey he would enjoy drinking. Never bitter or sharp, Maker's Mark is made with a red, a soft red winter wheat instead of the usual rye for a one-of-a-kind full-flavoured bourbon that's easy to drink. Now, to ensure consistency, they rotate every barrel by hand and they age their bourbon to taste, not time. Each and every bottle of Maker's Mark is, is still hand-dipped in their signature red wax at our, their distillery in Loretto, Kentucky. Just like Bill Senior would have... I literally was just reading off the Maker's Mark website, I'm not going to lie. But it's a good whiskey. It's got a nice look to it, that, that signature... Red wax. I don't know why I keep doing the uh, the the, the, what's the the that kind of W, but it, it sounds classy when I talk about whiskey that way. But no, it, it's very nice. It's definitely one of my favourite whiskies uh, to buy. Probably not my absolute favourite, uh, but definitely in the top ten uh, in terms of you know when I'm not spending stupid money on a bottle. Like when you want to spend I don't know less than fifty pounds on a bottle, it's pretty good. Now. In terms of my favourite premium whiskies, I, I, I don't want to spoil you, you know, this is going to be an ongoing series forever now, and since I do these videos every week, I, I, I've got to keep things spicy. Spicy, though, is not a, how I would describe Maker's Mark. I would say it is, um, I, I taste like bourbon. I'm not very good at describing how whiskey tastes, to be honest, so maybe this is not, maybe this series was a mistake. And I guess that could be extended to the rest of my channel, but you know, I enjoy it. It's very nice. It's a good sipping whiskey. It's fairly strong, 45%. A lot of whiskeys from the shop that I buy them from, which is just the supermarket, uh, tend to be about the 38% region. So, uh, no, I'm a big fan of Maker's Mark. So, Maker's Mark, I will give it... I would give it... Where would I rate it on the scale of whiskey that I'm making up on the spot? I'm going to give Maker's Mark a 75%. So thank you, Maker's Mark. Let's all just have a moment, a pause, a moment of silence for Maker's Mark. Thank you. And that was the end of Matt's Whiskey Reviews part of the commentary. Here we are. Well, Wow, we've missed a lot. So what did we miss? I did that I didn't talk about. We tested the escape pod. I made sure it worked and it did. It worked beautifully. We had the, we left uh, the first part of the space station in orbit. Now we are now well underway with the second, uh, well, the, the part two of two in terms of the launches, and that is, of course, the arms of the space station. So I launched at what I thought was a pretty good moment to launch, but I now realize that because the target is much, much higher, it wasn't actually a very good launch window to go for. So we're going to be ending up massively ahead of our target, which means I'm going to try and put ourselves into an orbit that's above the target. So initially I went for an apoapsis just above the 200 kilometer mark. Tested by making a maneuver note at Apoapsis to see if I could get a close encounter within one orbit. Couldn't, so I just burned up a little bit further, made a, well first of all I made a maneuver node just to see what effect that would have if I were to create a maneuver node at the new Apoapsis and it worked beautifully. So we can go ahead and execute that maneuver node and get ready to get our encounter. Now I think I got a separation of 0 0.3 in the end. I wasn't going to try and, I, I could if I'd spent a long enough probably got a zero kilometer separation but at the end of the day this is a fairly big burn we're about to do, you know, 95-ish, 100-ish kilometers per second. Kilometers per second, that would be a big burn. Meters per second. So it's going to be, it's not going to be an instant burn. So we're not going to get things dead on. Like the ultimate uh, outcome of the burn is not going to mirror exactly what the maneuver node said it would result in. So uh, I didn't want to get, I didn't have to worry about getting things too accurate. But as it turns out, you know, we ended up getting a 0.3 kilometer separation right off the bat. You may notice what I did, I do this a lot of the time, is I cancelled out the burn just before it was complete, just so I could manually watch again, because I knew that, you know, the result of burns is not always exactly the same 
as the maneuver node. So during when it has to be a very precise burn, such as ones like this, I tend to do the last part by just watching the nodes come together manually so I can make sure things transpire the way I hope them to. So, it's, oh, actually, we ended up with 0.4 kilometer separation. I lied to you, I'm so sorry. So now we are rapidly approaching our target. We're going to go through the standard beats that I tend to do, which is kill off all of our speed by burning retrograde, or <laughs> kill off all of our speed relative to our target by burning retrograde relative to the target. Burn towards it um, by pointing towards the target node on the, menu, on the nav ball. <laughs> And, uh, you know, then once we get a little bit closer, kill the full our speed again, and just rinse and repeat. You may have noticed, the more astute uh, viewers among you may have noticed that we have no RCS thrusters on this thing. Not a problem. We can dock it without RCS. So the first thing we're going to do is attach the fuel tank, because that's how this thing is set up. We attach the fuel tanks first. I'm just trying to sort of, by using my eyes, really, <laughs> using my eyes, what a, what a sentence. By eyeballing it, I'm just sort of manually lining it up with the target. And then we can just coast towards it very, very slowly as so we have got plenty of time to make any adjustments. And I did make a slight boo-boo here. I was still, I'm pretty sure I was still controlling from the command pod. Like I'd set the command pod kind of midway along this craft's fuselage as the control point of the vessel, which clearly wasn't accurate enough. So I had to set the actual docking port itself, which is what you should do too. I set the docking port itself as our control point by, you know, right-clicking it and pressing control from here. And then, as you can see, the actual target node on the nav ball actually aligned with where our target was. And we've got a nice clean dock. Now we're going to do the same thing again for the other side with this arm here. So first things first, we're going to just coast along, get ourselves somewhat manually lined up, and then initiate the dock by... Uh, basically burning directly towards our target again, gradually, gradually, so we've got plenty of time to make small adjustments here and there. But as you can see, we've got things pretty clean. Do bear in mind, this footage is played back a lot, lot, lot faster than at the real-time speed, just because otherwise it would be a very boring video, I think. It would be way too long. So don't try and emulate the speed I seem to be doing it at, because I am doing it much, much slower, you know, uh, when I was actually doing the mission. Uh, compared to how I am doing it now, uh, as in, like, in the video that you are watching and hopefully enjoying and are anticipating leaving a like and a subscribe and a comment telling me what you think of Maker's Mark. Um, I know it's, it's a bourbon and some people like scotch. I like scotch. I appreciate a good scotch. But I do prefer bourbon. That tends to be my whiskey of choice. And I still don't know if it's bourbon or bourbon, so I've kind of been alternating in this commentary so that I both don't annoy both sides of the argument whilst simultaneously also annoying both sides of the argument. So I have satisfactorily annoyed everyone and also no one, which doesn't make any sense, but that's just the kind of commentary you get. If you'd like to improve these commentaries, why not donate to my Patreon? No. JK, JK. Here you can see me recovering, moving swiftly on. Here you can see me recovering the lower stage, but you know that's dumb. We can cut away now to the deployment of the solar panels, which it does, uh, it is regrettably not as good as the initial concept design of this space station, which was to have the robot arms extend out. I know I could have kind of circumvented, circumnavigated the problem, circumvented the problem is the correct word there, by just having either the solar panels arranged on a rigid beam that just never unfolded in the first place. It was just always in the unfolded position. Or alternatively, uh, just having the big gigantic solar panels that can just extend out from the actual fuselage of the ship. But neither of those solutions looked very good. And especially in the case of having rigid arms that don't unfold, obviously we would have had to have launched a very, very wide payload, which would have needed a very, very wide and unrealistic fairing. Which, you know, I kind of I kind of liked the fact that the rockets in this video have looked pretty realistic. So I didn't want to do that. And as you can see, this is really frustrating. That uh, aerial wouldn't extend because it says it's stowed away, even though the actual shroud of the storage is deployed. So you'd think everything would then be not stowed because it's been deployed. Kind of weird. That piece has always caused me problems. Like, I'll store parachutes in it, which is clearly the intention for that piece. Because it's meant to sort of make the uh, stock command pod you look more akin to the Apollo style command pod but it doesn't work because when you put parachutes inside it they'll just say de can't deploy when stowed even when you deploy the uh, fairing around it so it's kind of dumb and I've mentioned it to squad and apparently that's not a glitch that's just how it be so whatever there's our Kerbals looking happy as can be on their small space station it's small boy that that is it there I hope you enjoyed this kind of Kind of a silly vision, really, but uh, I do like making space stations. It's always fun, and uh, people seem to uh, respond well 
to my Space Station videos as well. They generally tend to do better than my other videos. So I think, hopefully, you guys like them too. If not, sorry about that. On screen, there are links to videos that hopefully you might prefer if you are one of those people. But if not, uh, I don't know, because the video is over anyway.